Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. More information is at FarmBureauAdvantage.com. The Remarkable Soybean. From its oil, we get products like ink, candles, and paint. From its meal, we get a high-protein fiber used in foods and animal feeds. Natural soy is replacing chemicals and products you use every day. You can learn more about soybeans at VASoybean.com. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Contact us to find out how you can, you can milk it for all it's worth. Well, it won't be long until spring is here and maple syrup operators will be hard at work. This week we visit the operation of Falling Bark Farm, which makes not maple syrup, but hickory syrup. It's a successful family-run business that started out at their local farmer's market. We'll also explore the topic of quality control when it comes to cattle production. Does quality really pay? It's all straight ahead on this episode of Virginia Farming. I'm Jeff Ishy. Virginia cattle producers understand that no matter the product, attention to detail and quality can make all the difference in a livestock operation. Bob Severe is with the American Angus Association and files this report. Bigger isn't always better. Quality matters more than quantity. A generational sheep farming family applies those lessons to their lives and their Angus cattle. One of my brothers and I, we started talking about why, why aren't we in the cattle business? Uh, people always just say, well, sheep and cattle don't, aren't compatible. Well, that's a bunch of hooey. In fact, the Hamiltons are proof that two species can share more than just land in the resources they use and the satisfaction they bring to the consumer. We know from our experience with sheep, when a guy goes in to buy a plate of lamb chops, they want the same size lamb chop every meal eating experience they have. With consistency in mind, they only buy bulls from closed herds and build theirs with marbling and docility. We're looking at longevity of production. We're looking at ease of, of maintenance. We're looking at ease of from disease resistance. The less we have to keep them to stay healthy, it helps us in our bottom line. It helps us in our margin. The men find less market incentive for an animal with superior quality in the sheep industry. But those premiums are building in the cattle business. The reward by putting a high quality product that people enjoy is, is tremendous. It's, it's so self-satisfying. Chasing that reward sometimes means culling a cow based on a lack of performance, no matter how pretty she may look along the California coast. The cow is a, that's your production unit, and she's a very expensive production unit, and you want the, the most efficient ones on the ranch, not the ones that are costing you money or not giving you the maximum production. Consistency. That's the beginning and the end. Because even in a down market, Hamilton says quality, like the certified Angus beef brand, will always sell first. If our product's going to have a CAB brand on it, that it's the best quality and most consistent quality we can produce. And I think that gives us a lot of pride. And how that pride comes back is when the customers that we're selling to come and want to get more calves from us. I'm Bob Cervera. Thank you, Bob, for that report. Amy Rocher travels to Northern Virginia this week to meet the operators of a hickory syrup operation. It's coming up next on Ag Insights. Today we're visiting Berryville, Virginia, and we're in the home of Joyce and Travis Miller. Now they're the owners and makers of Wildwood's Hickory Syrup. They've been on the show before, but we wanted to come back so we could share with you how they make the syrup. It's, it's a really amazing story. Joyce and Travis, thank you so much for having us today. Great, welcome. Thank you. To our place. Now, Wildwood's Hickory Syrup has changed. You've changed the name. Tell us what the new name is and why it's changed. Well, we initially started our bu little business going to a farm market. So Wildwood's Hickory Syrup came about, uh, just kind of made up driving down the road, thought it was clever for the type of product that we had, and there was no really thought into the, this being a viable business. And as the good fortune has come to us that the business has grown, 
uh, we thought we should at least research and see if there was any uh, infringement on someone else's business and we discovered that there, yes, was a uh, Wildwoods Hickory uh, Wildwoods natural food producer in the United States. So we thought, well, let's do the right thing and uh, pick a new name, get it trademarked and registered and move forward from there. And now it is Falling Bark Farm. That's right. correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for our viewers who may not have seen the show you were on before, you guys make syrup out of hickory bark, like this bark that's sitting right here. That's correct. Now that particular bark has come from a shag bark hickory. Mm -hmm. uh, our product is a, uh, is a product of a variety of hickories, but this particular bark sheds naturally from the shag bark hickory tree. The other barks come to us as a byproduct from cabinet makers, woodworkers, uh, where there's no further use left to the material and then therefore we do the blend and come up with developed our recipe around that availability. So Travis you mentioned a recipe but what gave you the idea to say hey we should be able to make syrup out of hickory bark? Well uh, we were actually looking at a lot of different products to take to the farm market. Hickory syrup was not on our list so in researching those other ideas through the internet, uh, looking for variations, things that tied in with all seasons, all different food groups. Uh, as you know, anything that you might search on the internet, sometimes you get a little distracted or off your focus and you end up with reading about something you had no intention on. And that's basically what had happened here. We started reading about hickory and ended up into hickory smoke and then we ended up into the hickory syrup idea. We also found out there weren't too many people in the country making it, so we knew we had the resources and decided, and Travis said, you know what, we can, make we can make this. We can really do it. And I said, okay, I'm on board. Here we go. Yep. So we made the product, um, shared it with our family and friends, and got their feedback, and uh, really the whole product has been evolving probably for uh, the first 12 months into what we found that we, we really preferred. And with the introduction to the farm market, uh, exposed our product to a lot of folks and we were well received and we just took it from there. And you guys have grown. Uh, about how many bottles do you, I don't know how you do your counts, is it weekly or monthly, but how much syrup do you sell? We have a bookkeeping system now, so it's just a matter of click and you know, okay. everything comes up. So when we saw you last, we were selling about 11,000 units a year. This year, by the end of the year, we're set, we're on track to sell 30,000 bottles. It's amazing. I want to talk a little bit about the bark. Um, you prefer the shag hickory bark. Tell us, tell us why and, and where you get it from. Well, the shag bark, we initially, that's what our product was made from. Uh, because the availability was a matter of just going out in the woods and foraging for it. So you would just look on the ground around the shag bark hickories and you would pack that up and haul it out. So uh, we have since learned that the hickory bark in general is the highest plant source of magnesium. And once again, the bark from the shag bark is blended with other hickory barks because we now have some suppliers who have volunteered to uh, help us on our way and keeping our inventory so that we can uh, produce more volume. Okay. And Joyce, you had mentioned to me uh, off camera about some of your suppliers and how this has all come about. Share that story with our viewers. We've been to street shows and one time some uh, a young guy's mother came up to us and said, and listened to the whole story, and she goes, you know, my son works for a company and they supply barbecue places with hickory wood. They have to pay somebody to haul the bark away. Would you guys be interested? I said, yeah, we'll be, we'd be interested. Tell us where to be and when to be there. So we ended up showing up and asked them how much the bark would cost, and they said you'd be doing us a favor by hauling it away. Wow. And since then, two or three other businesses, either um, wood export, lumber exporters, or uh, who uh, woodworkers. Well, this does not look very appealing <laughs> to eat. So I want you to walk us through the process. That's why we're here today. We want to see exactly how you guys do this. How do you take this 
and turn it into this delicious syrup. Well, once the bark has come to us from the foragers or suppliers, we're going to take that and we just do a manual scrubbing of the bark, just like you might imagine with a scrub brush and water. Once that process has been completed, we'll take and do an open flame roasting. Uh, we initially started out using ovens and now uh, the open flame process seems to be a little more efficient and gives us uh, what we thought was a better tasting product. So once that has been done, we'll go ahead and do our extraction. We have either an aging or resting process that goes on after the extraction's been done. We'll take that particular product and uh, filter it out. Uh, we do multiple filterings on that. Then it's brought in and uh, heated to uh, 211 degrees with an uh, appropriate amount of sugar that's been regulated with a hydrometer. After that, it's filtered for the last time and then it's, been, it's bottled in excess of 185 degrees. That's our base product. If it was something uh, that involved uh, brandy adding, we would do that during the cooking process. The alcohol is gone and uh, that just becomes an infusion of flavor at that point. It fits the uh, one that you see here in front. That has been actually produced. It's been stored and used rye whiskey barrels from a local distillery, Catoctin Creek Distillery in Percival, Virginia. After 100 days, that's taken back out of the barrels, reprocessed again, and then bottled. And that's what you see here on the table for us. Now, how many different flavors or varieties of this syrup do you offer? Because we, you just talked, we have whiskey that's been infused with, from the whiskey barrel yes. and brandy. Yes. And what are the others? Well, we have, we'll take the original product that I first spoke about and we'll bottle it with a whole vanilla bean that we put down inside each bottle. And those vanilla beans that we use are certified organic. Uh, the longer the bean stays in the bottle, the more of that infusion that takes place. So that would be uh, a vanilla infused hickory syrup. I mentioned we do one with brandy. We also do a combination of those two. We'll take the brandy syrup and we'll bottle it with that vanilla bean. So you have brandy and vanilla. So that's a total of four that we offer currently. So every flavor of your syrup begins with the original hickory syrup. That's correct. And then you make changes to that according to the flavor. That's correct. That's our baseline okay. product there. Now, last time we talked, you guys were doing this by yourselves because you were supposed to have retired and then you came up with this idea and all of a sudden it took off. Well, since then, you've tripled your production. Is it just still the two of you doing all this? Right now, pretty much it's the two of us. Every now and then we get some volunteers to help at a show so we can go to two, sh two shows on one day and every now and then we have some people come in to stir the pot a little bit and help us make some syrup. But right now we're at a crossroads, I think, aren't we? Sure. And we have to decide whether we're gonna go bigger and hire people or if we're gonna stay the same. We have to make a few decisions. Well, we're sitting in your kitchen, mm -hmm. which is also your production plant. Right. You're making all your syrup right here. You're bottling all your syrup right here. So are you, do you need to move out of this to get into a bigger area to, to accommodate the demand you've had? Well, that's, that's what we're exploring right now. Joyce and I have struggled about what, what is the right thing to do because we recognize at uh, this point in our life that more may not always be better you know, as we develop the business. So uh, right now what we're doing is just taking it day by day. We're taking steps currently to uh, expand the facility and that would in turn allow us to bring in additional help on a regular basis and then allow us to be able to make decisions about uh, sh should we work to expand the business or does that just actually give us more free time uh, or to take care of the other details that sometimes get missed. Now you guys do private label syrups as well for a lot of tourist venues in Virginia. Right, mostly historical locations. Tell us about that. Who, who, who has private labels for you guys? We're expanding that all the time. Uh, right now we have Belgrove Plantation, Frontier Culture Museum, Morven Park in Leesburg. We have Mount Vernon, Monticello, Woodrow Wilson, uh, Library and Museum in Stanton. And Poplar Forest in Forest, Virginia. Uh, Thomas the... Jefferson's Poplar Forest, yeah. that's our latest addition. I want to talk a little bit about some of the other things we have sitting here on this table. Let's start with the honey. This is premium raw honey with cayenne and lime. 
So what's the story behind the honey? Because this doesn't come from the bark, does it? No, it doesn't. The honey, we do have bees ourselves. Okay. And uh, we first got involved on the bees, want to do our part to help stabilize the population here in the country where we understand that 50% of all the honeybees in America are no longer are here. So a lot of folks would approach our booth when we were doing direct marketing thinking we had honey and then learning that the product available was syrup. So we thought one day, well, we'll take some of our honey. So we did that. Now that ha has been expanding quite rapidly as well. All the honey is a raw honey. It's, a, it's just had a light filtering to move, we'll say bee parts, mm -hmm. wings and legs and wax. And uh, it's never been heated. So what makes us different than most places in the honey area is that we're offering these different infusions. The one you read was a chili and lime, which has become quite popular. A lot of people use that as a uh, something to glaze at the end for a little caramelization or even to use in a salad dressing. So that's just been uh, an addition to the family of products that we were offering with the syrups. And our most recent uh, adventure really has been the uh, coffee beans. We take green coffee beans and we allow them to become enriched inside of used dry whiskey barrels. Uh, once that's been completed, they're locally roasted and that's a product we're now offering. Well, it's wonderful. And I think that you're making such a good product and people obviously are liking it and you're doing a super job with it. Well, thank you thank very you. much. I and appreciate that. We, we, right now we're uh, partnering with maybe 160 different businesses, whether it be restaurants or retail centers, anything from uh, health big food box stores. stores. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. could be Whole Foods or, like Joyce says, health food stores, mom and pops, or Christmas tree farms. You know, have been taking notice and in the marketplace to offer something besides Christmas trees, and we t we tie in nicely with that season. And also the folks who are helping us with our coffee beans, the roasters, uh, Black Dog Coffee in West Virginia, they okay. roast our coffee beans for us. Yeah, because so. some of the uses are in hot drinks, whether it's coffee or tea for mm -hmm. the syrups. You know, and of course that ties in nicely with the honeys as well. Okay. All right. Now, if someone wants more information on your products or where they can buy them, where should they go? Well, on our website, we have... We can either do fallingbarkfarm.com or wildwoodshickorysyrup.com. We still trade as that until this whole transition takes place. So you can go there and under where to find us, we have many of our uh, supporters um, listed there. Okay. Speaking of supporters... We really would like to thank everybody out there who supported us this. Yeah, we continue to grow uh, exponentially. Yeah. yeah, and every single person who's ever bought a bottle of syrup or some honey, coffee beans, vanilla extract, and just, they're our biggest cheerleaders. Travis and Joyce, thank you so much for having us out today. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. You're welcome anytime. We'll be right back. Well, it has been said that farmers and gardeners are always thinking three seasons ahead. That's why we have a story today on blackberries from the ground up. Hi, today we're going to talk about blackberries. As you can see beside me here, we've got some beautiful plants full of fruit ready to go. And these, all this fruit shows you that these uh, plants can be a great addition to the home garden. They're very productive. Um, a home gardener could probably get 10 to 20 pounds for each plant over the growing season. So they're, they're a very nice plant, not too much disease and insect problems. They're a perennial crop, so they're gonna, they're gonna be here for a long time for you in the garden. One thing you have to think about, though, if you're gonna plant blackberries is site selection. And one of the things you need is a site that's got full sun, and you need to think about, um, as these plants get bigger, having plenty of room. So you don't wanna put them too close. Uh, you can see these rows are about 10 feet apart, and uh, spacing within the row is about four to five feet between each plant. So plenty of space and full sun, and that's a good site for blackberries. Now let's go look at uh, how we might start planting these plants. You just need well, as you're thinking about planting, one of the first things you need are plants. And you can buy bare-rooted plants that can be put in the ground in a lot of Virginia in March. And potted plants with the root ball attached can be put in after the last frost. Uh, they can be put into ground that's got a pH of around 6.5 to 7. 
Sandy soil is very good. Uh, heavier soils, if you can amend it with uh, some organic matter, will do very well for blackberry. Blackberry plants can require a lot of water throughout the season, and this is one way to irrigate or provide water through this drip irrigation line. Water comes down here and drips out right at the base of the plant. But they might require as much as one inch a week during the growing season. And another thing that helps keep that moisture in is mulch. Uh, the mulch that you see here is a hardwood mulch, and it can be applied to the surface here. It'll, of course, keep weeds down, and uh, probably more importantly, it'll keep that soil moisture in the ground. You just need a couple. A couple different types of blackberries, some that have thorns on the stem and some that are thornless. Of course, the thorn varieties are going to stick you a little bit when you work on them. So uh, thornless varieties can be nice for the home gardener. And there are lots of different types of those, lots of different varieties. Some produce crops earlier, some produce crops midsummer, and some late summer. So if you were a home gardener that wanted to put all three of those types in there, it would give you a longer range of harvest throughout the whole summer. Now one thing that blackberries need are going to be a trellis system. These plants grow up, but they will fall over. So they need to be trellised up on wires. What you see here is a trellis system that has, uh, that's called a V-trellis system, and it has wires, about six wires, high tensile wires, and they are uh, going to be holding up the canes. As they grow up, the canes are tied to these wires, and just supports them, keeps them from falling down, gives you a lot of air movement through there, so you'll have less disease problems. Uh, this is something that you can build the first season because you don't need it that first season, uh, but it can be a very important part of your uh, blackberry uh, production area in your garden. So after you have done all this work, one of the things that you really get to enjoy are the fruits of your labor. These beautiful, large-sized blackberries, sweet and juicy, ready to eat for you and your, uh, and your neighbors. For more information about blackberry production, please contact your local county extension office. From, from the ground up, I'm Chris Mullins. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Chris, for that report. Our pearl of wisdom this week comes from an anonymous viewer who says, once the game is over, the king and the pawn go back in the same box. That is absolutely true and certainly something to think about. Submit your own pearl of wisdom by visiting our website at virginiafarming.com. That does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Jeff Ishy for Virginia Farming. Ninety years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made our local farmers a promise to protect and preserve a way of life they work so hard to establish. We want to keep Virginia, Virginia. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member, and there's a local Farm Bureau in every county. More information is at vafarmbureau.org. Virginia soybean farmers are hard at work growing soybeans to produce products you use every day. Candles, soaps, even crayons can be made from soybeans. Remember, when you buy soy, you're helping to support American jobs, the economy, and our nation's energy security. Would you like to put your business in front of rural America and the ag community every week? We have sponsorship opportunities available that will do just that. Get in touch with us to hatch a new plan. We all want healthy rivers and streams, but we can't do that without help from Virginia's landowners. Resource Management Plans, or RMPs, are part of a voluntary program that helps farmers get credit for cleaning up our waters. And once you have an RMP, you are exempt from any new water quality requirements for nine years. The Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation has funds available to help you implement these plans. Contact the department today to learn more. Thank you.
This message sponsored by Virginia's agriculture community. Check out Virginia Farming on Facebook. Virginia Farming's Facebook page is a great way to stay connected with Virginia agriculture. You might even find some humor there too. You'll find links to events and happenings all over the Commonwealth that are of interest to farmers and consumers alike. So connect with us and share your stories and photos with the Virginia farming community and keep up to date on all things agriculture. Virginia Farming on Facebook.